Hi, this is TapCat, and welcome to the second half of my coverage of the latest information dropped by XCOM 2's creative lead, Jake Solomon. Yesterday, we covered all of the changes to our enemies, and today we'll focus on the changes to the heroes of the game, plus a few odds and ends that don't really fit well in either category. Let's start with something quick and simple. The Spark units are getting an upgrade. They'll be tougher, get a much needed accuracy boost, and you'll now be able to add weapon upgrades to their guns. So let's talk about the heroes. Just in case you need a reminder, we're looking at the Skirmishers, Templars, and Reapers. We'll get access to one early on, but opening the door to the others promises to be a lot tougher. The Reaper is a new type of stealth unit. Unlike Rangers, he'll have a chance to stay concealed after attacking. And they also bring a new kind of attack, where they'll throw a Claymore mine and then shoot it, at which point it will explode and damage the enemy. Let's set aside the fact that real Claymore mines can be triggered with a remote control in the here and now, even without XCOM's advanced technology and that needing to shoot it to make it explode is like something out of a bad remake of Tombstone, but I'm sure it'll look cool, and somehow this activity is guaranteed to keep you concealed from enemies even though you've attacked. Now even better, if you've picked the right ability, then doing this can even put you back into concealment if you were revealed to begin with. Now that sounds bonkers to me, but hey, I'll take it. Now you may be saying to yourself, Self? Who cares about stealth? What did it ever do for me? Well, listen, my child, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of the Reaper. When the Reaper is concealed, he'll move 50% faster, and enemies have a detection radius of exactly one tile. So he can go anywhere on the map at warp speed. It's good for scouting, flanking enemies, or just getting to a pesky mission objective right before the timer runs out. Not that I know anything about that. Now, if that's not enough, one of his high level abilities is Banish, which will fire every bullet still in his gun at any one target. Now that may not be quite as good as it sounds because most of the bullet sponges in the game have enough armor to significantly weaken that effect. But think of Archons, Berserkers, Andromedans in their second phase, and tell me it doesn't make you smile just a little. Next up is the Skirmisher. They have a wrist-mounted grapple that pull enemies to them, so you can finally become the Viper that you've hated all this time. Conversely, you can use the grapple to pull yourself toward them and finish them off with a melee attack. Their high-level ability that was revealed is Battle Lord, which turns your Skirmisher into the equivalent of an alien ruler in some ways. So when any alien takes an action and they're within your sight, it will allow you to take an action in turn. Now, there's too many specifics about how this will work that we don't know yet, but if we can actually move and fire throughout their turn, this could be very interesting. The Templars, unfortunately, are still mostly a mystery to us. They are psionic specialists, and I think it's a safe bet you won't need a psionics lab to get one up and running or level them up, and that's a welcome change. And maybe to make up for the fact that we weren't told much overall, we know two of their high-level abilities. One, Templars can create a clone of themselves, although we don't know how long that would last. And two, they can call down lightning on every enemy in the area around them. And if any of these bolts prove lethal, then the Templar's focus will be fully restored. I haven't seen an official explanation of focus, but it seems to be the Templar's version of ammunition or at least mana and will limit how many of his abilities you can shoot off. It's worth pointing out that each of the three hero classes also have specialized equipment. Custom rifles for the Reapers and Skirmishers. We already talked about the Skirmishers' Ripjack that acts as kind of a super grappling hook. And the Templars have Shard Gauntlets. Uh, not surprisingly, there's no other details on these, but it's safe to assume some kind of buffs to damage, a crit chance, or something that puts them a notch above ordinary weapons. 
That's the extent of our intel on the hero classes so far, but we haven't talked about how to get them. And it turns out that we'll buy them from a pool of ability points that are earned during combat. Each time you perform certain maneuvers like flanking or killing from a higher elevation than the target, you'll have a chance to earn a point. I'm going to say right now, I love this idea because it literally builds in a reward structure for players that employ tactics that are generally sound to begin with. And if this gets spelled out in the game, and we don't know that yet, it could really help newer players learn some fundamental tactics and get traction in the game. But these ability points can also be used to purchase abilities for your existing soldiers. The Advanced Warfare Center is out and a new training center facility is in. Instead of each soldier being randomly assigned one hidden ability, now there will be a pool of four you can choose from. And it'll be up to you whether you want to buy abilities for each soldier. If you wanted to, you could buy all four for one. Just be aware, some of these abilities are more expensive than others. So you really are going to need to get out there and flank the hell out of those aliens and fill up your ability points piggy bank ASAP. Uh, my final note on this topic is that I'm thrilled with this change. As a player, I'm far more interested in having to weigh costs versus benefits and make hard choices than I am in just taking whatever result random chance hands me. And that's basically what the AWC was doing. I mentioned that you have to buy heroes, but let's talk about who you buy them from. The resistance factions will be visible in a variety of ways. Well, visible and audible. When we're on the world map, we'll hear resistance radio, and they're going to comment on our actions and put their own spin on it. And apparently the advent speaker will also chime in at times when we come back from missions. Now that's basically fluff, and the resistance definitely goes deeper than that. Cultivating a relationship with these factions sounds like it's going to be well worth doing. We'll be able to acquire perks along the lines of getting instant kills every time you hit a lost, reducing the progress on the Avatar project by one bar each month, having Advent troops defect to your side, and more. We're only going to get to take so many of these, but the ones we know about so far sound pretty good to me. There's also going to be missions where resistant soldiers will fight on the map and they'll help you but they're actually going to have a turn of their own. And going back to the idea of making tough choices, each faction will have different perks. So you have to figure out where to put the bulk of your time and resources and whose favor you want to go after the most, because I don't think you're going to get very far if you're trying to court all three at once. And the resistance factions also play a major role in hunting down the chosen. If you want to track down a Chosen to its Citadel, you'll have to spend points with its rival resistance faction to do it. Oh wait, a rival resistance faction? Yeah, that's right. It's not an accident that there are three Chosen and three resistance factions. So each faction is going to have kind of a grudge match going with a particular Chosen. And that will be randomly assigned at the start of the campaign. And they'll be able to show you the location of that citadel, but only if you perform covert actions for them first. And we'll talk more about the covert ops later. But if you do enough for them, then you can finally get the chance to take out that chosen. And my guess is that long before the game is over, these guys will be more annoying than a caltrops in your shoe. And killing one is going to be sweeter than candy. Now, interestingly, Jake Solomon predicted that it would probably be common for players to not get around to killing all three prior to the final mission. If that happens, though, you're going to find the surviving Chosen waiting for you together at some point before you start the end game missions at the radio tower. Well, as of today, there's no question, Mr. Solomon certainly knows a lot more about War of the Chosen than I do, but I'll tell you what. 
If it's possible to put all of the Chosen six feet under before the final assault on the alien base, then old Tapcat is going to make it my mission to blow each of them away to whatever alien hell they crawled out of in the first place, and I'll be smiling when I do it. No brag, Jake. Just fact. <laughs> and killing Chosen won't just be emotionally satisfying. You'll get their weapons, too. The Hunter Sniper Rifle has a number of upgrade slots, and it takes just one action to fire. And yes, the Assassin Swords and the Warlock Rifle is also ours for the taking, and they'll probably also be well worth claiming. I promised to talk more about covert actions, so let's do that. They were a very cool idea in XCOM Enemy Within, but the reality of sending a soldier into combat armed with a BB gun and wearing armor roughly as protective as a hospital gown to square off against aliens armed with plasma rifles and dead-eye marksmanship that would make a Special Forces sniper green with envy, it was a bit of a miss. This time around, you'll send a pair of soldiers in with an option to send a third or give up that extra firepower for an engineer or scientist. Apparently, there's even options that include equipment or intel that could help them get out of a jam if something goes wrong, although we don't know a lot of the specifics of that yet. Now, if things do go wrong and you didn't take the right precautions, you could be looking at having your squad captured. If you're lucky, though, it could also just trigger a mission where you control them on a map and you try to escape from advent and lost enemies. Now, those covert actions are how we're going to blunt the progress of the Chosen in their attempt to mess with the Resistance, and, and it's also how we'll interact with the Resistance for the most part. And it sounds like we're going to want to do a lot of them, maybe more than we possibly can. So again, prioritizing where to put those efforts is going to be key. And you can even build another new facility called the Resistance Ring that will help run the covert actions faster. And seriously, another new facility? I'm telling you, either the Avenger is getting more slots to build in, or we're definitely going to see at least one other existing facility retired. You heard it here first. You know, in the real world, we like some of our coworkers a whole lot more than others, and XCOM 2 is headed down that same path. Every soldier will be randomly assigned a compatibility score with every other soldier, ranging from low to very high. When we send soldiers on either tactical or covert missions together, their relationship will have the chance to deepen. And at the end of a mission, there could be a level up between the two. And the camera is apparently going to do some kind of zoom in on the two of them having a beer together or you know, shooting at a firing range or something like that. And then Bradford will declare that the two can form a bond. At that point, you can level them up with no further effort. But after the first level, you'll have to have them spend time in the training center to move it forward. Now, you might ask what going up in these levels of bonding will get you. Well, at the first level, it could involve one soldier giving up one action on a turn so that the other can take an extra. And at the third level, you could do that twice on a mission, as well as employ a new ability called Dual Strike. Now, that basically means that when one of the soldiers fires at an enemy, the other will too, and it won't cost them an action. It wasn't clear whether this is an activated ability with a cooldown, or even just like once a mission, or if this is an always-on passive ability. And that's a huge difference between the two, so we're going to have to wait to see just how good that really is. Another benefit of bonding is that if one of them goes to the other, it will cleanse them of all negative mental effects, and that should include the day's effect that the Chosen will be using against us. And finally, bondmates will also complete covert actions faster. And then we come to Will. Up until now, Will has played a small role in XCOM 2 and represented your resistance to panic and psionic attempts to manipulate or control you. 
Now it's going to be integrated with a new fatigue system. From now on, we'll need to rotate soldiers out of combat missions to rest or be punished fairly severely. For starters, a tired soldier's will is going to drop. And if they're hurt or exposed to enough enemies, then it will drop even faster. Low will is going to make them more vulnerable to stuns, panic, and mind control. And if that's not enough, if you send an already tired soldier on a combat mission, they can acquire negative traits. So one example of that is you could order a soldier to go on Overwatch and instead he'll just fire his weapon right then. Or he might become obsessed with always keeping his rifle fully loaded. So let's say you move him for his first action. Before you can do anything else, he may just reload for the second. So you can literally lose control over your own soldier if you overwork them. Now, at least some of the negative traits are a little simpler to deal with. They may be afraid of a particular enemy type and hunker down when they see them or maybe go berserk. The traits like this, they only trigger once in a mission and apparently they can be cured in the infirmary. But I assume that means even more downtime in addition to the rest that they already needed. All right, if you're still with me, hang in there because we're in the home stretch. So next, research has been tweaked to include breakthroughs and inspirations. Breakthroughs are random events and will occasionally be offered a chance at a new technology that offers a random perk like bonus damage to a certain weapon type or having the cost of a particular facility. But like an unrepentant car dealer, this will be a one-time offer and no longer available once you walk away. Inspirations are offered in a similar way, but those are a little simpler. Essentially, you're just going to be offered a standard tech, but it's some kind of discount so that it takes less time to research. My impression on this is pretty simple. Be careful and pick your spots for accepting these. Stay focused when you're pursuing truly critical research. There are techs like magnetic weapons and plated armor you need to get to ASAP. And if you spend all your time chasing rainbows instead, simply because they're essentially on sale, then you'll lose more and more soldiers on the battlefield in a version of XCOM 2 that demands more able bodies than it ever has before. We're also going to get some new equipment. One is the Lost Lure that can direct the Lost to attack a given area. And again, I'm wondering if it will be a viable strategy to purposely use explosives to bring the Lost in and then use them against Advent. Or at least take advantage of their presence when they do show up on their own. And if so, it would definitely inspire the same kind of joy for me, usually reserved for enraging berserkers until they attack the Advent troops that are escorting them. Another new toy is the Sustaining Sphere. This prevents a soldier from dying and will bring them back with one health the following turn. With everything we've talked about, would it surprise you to know that campaigns will now be longer? The estimate is that they're going to run 10 to 15 missions more than they currently do. So get ready for the game to become even more of a marathon, especially on Legend. There's also a completely new challenge mode. Apparently, your forces would be pre-selected and could include both humans and aliens. This is completely separate from the campaign. They'd be one-off missions and they're somehow scored competitively and will give us a chance to compete against each other to appear on a leaderboard. I really don't know what to make of this, but we'll see how it looks once we know more. All right. If you've made it this far, then hopefully you found the video interesting. If so, please give it a like to help other people find it. I'll continue to cover War of the Chosen up through the release, so if you want to see more, then by all means subscribe to the channel. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. I hope we see you next time.